Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Our mission is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape their communities that we call home. Joining us for today's episode is from the city of Welland, Councillor Sharmila Setera. Now, if you were to ask someone from the city of Welland what makes Welland a great place to live, work, play, and invest, well, for them, it's quite simple. It's the community. It's the people. It's the facilities. It's the amenities. In Welland, they are fortunate to have the big city conveniences with the small town feel many municipalities strive for. With a college, museum, libraries, farmer's market, and so much more, the city of Welland is more than a place. It's home. Attention Saskatchewan. This election season, Municipal Affairs is hitting the road in partnership with SUMA for the Saskatchewan Provincial Election. Join us on election night for live coverage straight from Regina on YouTube featuring exclusive insights from municipal leaders and stakeholders across the province. We will be capturing their reaction to the results and be diving into what the new provincial government means for municipalities. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan to hear directly from local leaders about the issues that matter most to you. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan starting September 30th to hear directly from local leaders like yourself about the issues that matter most. This is your election covered like never before. Municipal Affairs, your trusted voice from the grassroots to the government. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me this morning and doing this. Greatly appreciated. I want to start by getting the age-old question that is the cross-border interviews right off the bat, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? That's a great question. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. Um, really, it came from my mom, and that's where I'm going to say family as always. Uh, I grew up in a single-parent-led family of six kids. And even though at times we didn't have much, my mom really instilled that civic duty that we could always help, that we could always get involved in the community. And uh, she helped us to kind of have that civic duty by volunteering in the community, uh, joining things like Girl Guides of Canada, where you really get that sense of leadership and involvement in the community. And then uh, where and when she was able, to, with my dad as well, um, you know, trying to get involved in sports and being active. And then that sense of team leadership that you have. Uh, we, we were a family of primarily baseball and softball. Um, and so having that kind of outlet, you know, interacting with different people in the community, that's where it really started. So I would say, you know, it started at home and then it kind of grew from there uh, based on our life experiences, some of the challenges we had. And then when I got into high school and you have all these social clubs, which I always thank the teachers for volunteering their time to do, because, you know, that really, um, that's really where I think you come alive on your interests uh, and, you know, really can direct you where you go throughout life. Was mom and dad political or was mom political at all? Or where did you get your political itch from, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so um, actually neither of them are political. They're just trying to survive. So it wasn't uh, like in some other cultures where uh, you might say, like, let's get involved in politics. Let's join a political party. It really didn't come from that. It came really from uh, actually just from living in poverty and trying to survive and looking at some of the inequities. And so that's really how I got involved in advocacy. When we really look at it, trying to help people was through human rights causes. And I've been a volunteer with Amnesty International Canada for like 20 years. Actually, it's been more than that for 20 plus years, uh, which I got involved in in high school, but that's where it came from. And I took a while to understand, like, you know, what's the difference between human rights advocacy and getting involved in politics? Um, you know, where do you make that that crossover? And so, you know, I've been active in a lot of things, but it really wasn't until um, I got involved with Equal Voice that I thought more seriously about actually running. Uh, because the finances always seem to be a barrier in my network. You know, do I know enough people who would donate? Uh, do I have enough friends that are involved in political parties that would think it's worth it? 
And so there's like a bit of that kind of leap from a lot of people do this type of advocacy in their community to then wanting to get into politics. Okay, so I I I love these types of conversations because I never know how people are going to answer those first two questions, and it gives me opportunity to ask questions that I traditionally don't ask, but I want to ask, uh, go down a sort of a pathway if you don't mind for a second, and you you talk about the barriers about getting involved in politics, particularly not even just the federal or provincial, but municipal. Traditionally, many people may think that municipal politics, you just fill out a paperwork, you submit it, and that's it. You don't have to do much fundraising. But for cities the size of Welland, it's not a cheap endeavor to run down the municipal realm, and you need fundraising. Do you think that's an obstacle for a lot of people putting their name on the ballot? It really it really is. Like, you can run with, you know, you, you can run with maybe $500, but that could still be an obstacle for somebody. But when you look at the average spend, depending on the size of your city, it can be anywhere from 5000 to 10000 to more if you have a model where you're running at large across your city. So the finances um, can be challenging, and it's really hard to advocate for people to spend money on you, you know, versus a cause. Uh, but we really do need that. Signs cost money, having a website, having postcards, getting things delivered. Um, and so it's one of the one of the things that I started to tell people is not enough just to vote. If you want to see a certain vision in your city, if you like a certain count, you know, candidates um, perspective on issues, you need to go the next step and you need to join their campaign team, uh, whether it's giving in time or giving in finance. I, I listened to an interview that you did probably about a few months after you got elected in 2022. And in that interview, and I apologize if I'm forgetting the name of the interviewee and I, the, the interviewer, sorry. And you, during the interview, you said that you were one of the first four females ever elected to the city of Welland's council. And you're, you hope one day that that would yeah. be parody. Yeah. You hope that one day that that would be equal female and male representation on that city of council in your work with equal voice and now sitting on council, have you made st uh, strides to ensure that women do have a place or feel that they can be put on that uh, ballot in the next general election in 2026? Uh, yeah, thank you for this question. I love it. And, and just so I can say this, that one of the reasons I said that is that in well and here currently, our uh, council structure is that we've got two people per ward and we're part-time counselors. So I just like give some framing of that. So when you've got 12 counselors and six wards, uh, you know, that goal is a lot more obtainable. So certainly uh, I've already had several women reach out to me uh, wondering how do they get involved in politics? What's it about? What are some of the challenges? You know, how do they learn more about what's involved and uh, I've already directed them to some resources in the community uh, and actually Equal Voice in their virtual campaign school, uh, but also I've directed them that if they are political and some of them are that they are affiliated with political parties, that those political parties also have um, training available for candidates about, you know, what does it take to run? What does it mean? How do you prepare yourself? And part of it is just really finding resources and finding somebody that you can connect with. And I think part of that has also come from uh, some of the work that I've done on council and the motions that I've brought forward uh, that people see, OK, I can make a difference. And these things can really vary from small initiatives to big policy that we're bringing forward and ideas. And uh, one of the first motions that I had on council, and I hadn't anticipated this to be the first, but was on uh, bringing in, uh, looking at uh, poverty in our community. And uh, one option that we could look at is uh, reducing period poverty and then having, um, you know, tampons and pads available in our, uh, in our washrooms throughout the city. And so out of that, I, I heard from a lot of women actually, you know, saying that they see, they, they feel seen, um, and I said, you know, these are some of the issues and the perspectives that we bring when we have that different lived experience and diversity around the table, uh, because there's different issues. So, you know, when people see you're working on issues that are close to home, uh, you know, it starts to encourage you that you can be in there, that you have a role at the table, that these are issues that need to be spoken about and oftentimes are missed. You are roughly about two years into your first term from what I gathered 2022 was your first time that you put your name on the ballot 
looking back on the last two years in office, was it what you expected prior to getting involved and putting your name on that ballot? Or was there one moment when you went, whoa, this is not what I anticipated the role of a counselor would be in my city? Um, I actually put my name on the ballot one time before in 2018, uh, just um, to, to share that. So that was uh, when I lived in Mississauga. Um, and really, okay. yeah, but yeah and that's okay. It's yeah, no, I learned a lot. And so, you know, I, at that point, put my name on the ballot, um, because I, you know, I was inspired out of the work that I was doing and said, you know, I really have to walk the talk. And once you put your name on the ballot, you get a lot of different experience, um, and perspectives that you don't have, you know, until you actually make that run, no matter how many, um, people you hear from and champions in the community. Uh, but, uh, so far, um, it is what I expected. And, um, and you have to know, you know, when you get, you're going to have tough days, and you're going to have really days that are filled with excitement. And you're going to be kind of riding on a bit of a roller coaster at times. But I uh, received some really great work advice, um, you know, that you need to have, you know, your your values and your legacy, you know, set out, like, what are you trying to achieve? What impact are you trying to have? So that when you have those tough days, uh, that you can remember, oh, yeah, this is why I said I would do this. And this is why I continue to put in all the effort that I do, because this is the possibility of the outcome. And I'll say the other piece is that some of my previous volunteering work, uh, when I was working, uh, when I was volunteering with Amnesty International, it involved going to global assembly meetings. It involved speaking about really tough issues, uh, like sexual reproductive rights, uh, use of uh, armed forces, uh, you know, just a variety of pieces where you're trying to bring 60 countries together to decide, you know, what is the policy that you're going to take on this? What's the direction or how are we going to invest the, you know, our collective movement funds and what does activism look like? So some of that prepared me for what I experience here in council in terms of different views, uh, values being different, um, you know, competing priorities and now trying to pull this all together and work with, you know, your 12 other peers to make decisions on behalf of the city. You talk about the roller coaster ride that you often find yourself on as a counselor. There's good days, there's bad days. And I say good days and bad days and the decisions that you have to make. Some decisions are a lot easier. Some decisions are a lot tougher. We are in a very tough spot economically right now across this great country. Prices are skyrocketing. And you as a level of government have the ability to help or hurt some people or who are out there with decisions you make how do you ensure and i say this as you as just the individual counselor here how do you ensure that the decisions you're making around that council table will impact the most people in the most positive way possible knowing that some people may potentially be struggling with some of the decisions you make yeah, that's 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 certainly the tough question. Um, one thing is that I encourage as many people as possible to give their input when we have consultations. And I do that first as a step. And I try to remember who's talked to me or lobbied about me on issues or had complaints so that they can give the perspectives that when we receive the reports, those show up and that those you know are an opportunity for their voice to be heard. Uh, when I'm looking at these decisions, I'm actually taking a, a people first approach. It's kind of what I came in about care and compassion and also looking at equity. And so sometimes it means that I am looking at, you know, maybe a smaller group of people that are most impacted and most vulnerable and taking a decision from that, uh, that perspective. Um, and I just share that because when we start to talk about issues around homelessness, encampments, uh, we are looking at a smaller group of vulnerable people where the outcome can be death. And so then I do look at it with a smaller lens, looking at these different kinds of considerations. But on the whole, uh, I am looking at it from beyond my ward, beyond the about nine to 10,000 people that I, I, I represent, uh, to look at it from the city. You know, what are the perspectives here? What is the long-term impact of these decisions, knowing that life is, is likely to get more expensive than less? And while we take those decisions, I'm also looking for what's the root cause or what's the systemic piece. And that's why I like working at the municipal level. 
well, how are we being impacted here? What are we act, being asked to fund? Do we have the right funding model? And if not, how do we then use our voice at the municipal level to advocate at the provincial and federal level for the changes in policies or changing in, changes in frameworks that we need uh, to help support people in our community? And I, I've just received an email. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, continue your statement because I, I'm going to basically yeah. follow up but add, start a new line of thought here. Go ahead. Perfect. I just want to give an example that I just received an email yesterday from a resident about, you know, that they're a senior citizen and I've been paying, um, you know, taxes for about 40 years. And they're like, you know, should there be a point in your life where you no longer have to pay taxes? And I think these are really great questions to start considering um, in terms of affordability. Uh, and it really, you know, it does spark, uh, it sparks interest, it sparks discussion. You, you talk about the um, engagement as aspect of the job. I would say 10, 15 years ago, even when I was covering municipal politics back in Ontario, there you'd be hard pressed to find a council meeting where people didn't show up. Even if it was a short council meeting, people would show up because Facebook wasn't a big thing. Social media wasn't a big thing. But in today's world, it's hard pressed to find people who actually show up to a council meeting on a regular basis to learn what's going on. So when you go out and you as a counselor go out to the community or when you're in the grocery store, do you get stopped and asked questions about what's going on in the community? And when they when residents do talk to you, are they talking about just municipal issues or are they talking about those bigger, broader provincial or even federal issues as well? Uh, they do stop me, <laughs> and uh, it's actually it's 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 actually. Do you everything. enjoy that? Uh, if I if I have the time, I don't mind it because honestly, it's an opportunity to also dispel myths, and you have an active you have an active audience because they've taken time to also stop you and ask for a question, and sometimes it's even in front of my house uh, when I'm on a walk. So I take it as if I can answer that question um, or direct them to a, another resource then they're going to also share that within their network. So I always think it's worth it. But people ask all sorts of things from, you know, the complaints to why are we taking this perspective or how can we have money to pay for recreational facilities, but we don't have money to pay for more uh, roads. And, you know, I give, I give a chance to explain that part of it is also what grants we're able to get so we don't have to increase taxes. So it's not a, it's not one or the other. We're after everything. And it's kind of, you know, where can we get that additional funds? And then that's the work we're going to start to work on uh, while we have these behind the scene meetings. So I take that opportunity. Uh, we're lucky here in Welland that we do have regular people that do attend the meeting um, and they share their perspective, which I think needs to be applauded uh, and, and encouraged. And we have a bunch of people now that it's been online that they actually do uh, listen. And, and if they're not listening live, they watch it back on the weekend. And that's when they're having their breakfast and their um, and their coffee. And I, I you know, I, I don't know exactly what those numbers are, but we know that that people are doing that because they often tell us that I saw you, you know, on I like what you said or I saw you and I didn't like what you said. And so uh, I just think that that's great. And um, being able to be online opens up an audience to people where they don't have to come physically, where they can just tune into one section that they're interested in. How important is it for yourself as a counselor when you're making those tough decisions around that council table on certain issues to not just listen to the echo chamber? Because as municipal leaders, it's hard to go talk to every single one of your constituents on every single issue. But when you do reach out, people, and you've probably come to this realization, if you haven't, I'm going to burst your bubble here for a second, but you've probably come to the realization that every decision you make, not 100% of the people are going to be behind you. How important is it for yourself to listen to both sides of the issue, to hear the people who disagree with you, even after you've made a decision, and to the people who agree with you, which are probably more likely not to talk to you because they agree with you, so why would they come up to you? So how important is it for yourself to listen to all sides of all issues to ensure that you are not just representing the people who voted for you, but the people who also didn't vote for you? Yeah, um, I do listen to all the perspectives and uh, how I kind of come down to it um, is, you know, I, I take a human rights based approach to it generally for most of the decisions, um, because at the end of the day, uh, we're human and it's, you know, about 
and and it's a, it has a framework, you know, to really think about how are you taking these decisions. So sometimes I'm hearing comments and they're they're really inappropriate. And if they were out there in the public realm, um, you know, people probably wouldn't want them out there. But I hear them and I listen to them, and I really try to dig a little bit deeper. And part of it's usually frustration where it's getting people where they might be saying certain things that are are kind of um, I would say tiptoeing on, uh, you know, on identity issues and, um, and kind of uh, perpetuating this, but there's, uh, you know, but you always have to look at what makes sense, what, and we say that I should step back and say common sense. So who's common sense, but uh, I do mention about human rights frameworks, but it's also about looking at the reports. What do we already have? What, ev what is the evidence saying? about this issue? What are other municipalities um, within Ontario and other jurisdictions, what are they doing on these issues? And, you know, they might be further ahead than us. So what are some of the, the mistakes, the learnings that they've had, and how can we apply that to the city? So one of the things I say is like, if you want to be a counselor, you and a really good one, you need to be prepared to be doing your own research and your own reading so that you can come to your conclusions as well and be able to draw on other examples, um, you know, when we're bringing it to the city, particularly if they already exist. And, and you know, it's not an area where we're doing some trailblazing in. I want to turn to the city as a whole now, uh, because I'm cautious of time and I want to make sure we get this part in because I think this is an important conversation. But before I ask my first question, as I always do on the show, I'm going to preface this line of questioning with this statement. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and her opinion alone. That being said, it may line up with what's going on in council, but it's still her opinion. For those who are about to send me nasty emails, please don't. Or if you do, I will file them away in the appropriate folder, aka the recycling bin. Councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this in February, in the middle of February, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Welland today? Uh, one of the biggest issues is infrastructure. And uh, our city is not alone in this challenge. Uh, we have approximately a $75 million infrastructure deficit. And so this is why there are calls through our association, the Association of uh, Municipalities of Ontario to have different levels of government relook at our funding models at the, at the municipal level. That's one of the biggest challenges we have and people's expectations just continue to grow. If there's a crack in their sidewalk, um, if the, the road looks unsightly, uh, they, they expect that to be fixed and the, the cost of that just continues to increase. Um, and there's the water and wastewater infrastructure as well, uh, which when you're looking at road repairs, you're looking to bundle some of this work. And then there's drainage issues and, and a variety of other pieces. So for me, that's one of the biggest issues in the city. Uh, we're working really hard to address that, uh, trying to look for grants where they're available, advocating uh, to the different levels of government for the types of grants that would be helpful. Uh, for us and then trying to make those really tough decisions and it is challenging when residents will say well I've lived on my court and they do for 40 years and I you know I really want my roads to be repaired or my sidewalks but they're in such still good condition and we have other places where they're not so I would say that's one of the you know what that's one of the growing challenges um, and I think that will remain for some time and it's something that Canada as a whole that we need to look at uh, with our aging population as well you know how how you know, how do we manage this challenge? Is it also the type of um, beyond, say, the funding model? Is it also that we need innovation in the products and technology that we're using to solve some of these issues? And we're a very smart country with like smart people. Uh, and so certainly a holistic response is looking needed for that in the long term. So I, I, first off, congratulations on your recent election to the AMO uh, Board of Directors, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes. I, I just I was supposed to be in Ottawa for that, but unfortunately things got went sideways and I had, had to rush back to Calgary. Um, I want to talk about that infrastructure challenge that the city of Welland is facing, because you're right. You're not the only community. And if I speak to 4,000 municipal leaders from 4,000 different municipalities in Canada, they will all say infrastructure is a big priority. Now, grants you talked about, and grants, they're not, they don't sell every single issue. And with so many other municipalities 
vying for each one of those grants that you are guaranteed that you're not going to get 100% of them. How does the city of Welland, and I need you to speak as a counselor, but also as the whole council, envision moving forward in a time where people are struggling and you can't grow infrastructure or repair infrastructure on the backs of the people who are here, right here, right now? Because people are struggling, as we just talked about in the earlier segment, and infrastructure, as you know, is not that cheap anymore compared to what it was like 20 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, part of that is honestly education. And I, I I really honestly start there because when people hear the cost to replace something, they're really shocked. And I'll just even give an example because we, we started a campaign, which is amazing that our staff started about Love My Park and park is infrastructure as well. And when people asked, I, I attended one that's in my community, just a, a few blocks over from me. And people were like, that's the cost of replacing a park or adding this kind of structure in. They thought it's like 50,000. And we're like, no, you're looking at 750,000. Um, so first to me is the education on what is the cost. And I was just even doing that earlier today. Why is this road not taken care of? And I explained that, well, we needed to bundle the work because the water and wastewater um, lines need to be changed. And so when you're looking at the top, you're not doing a full uh, repaving, you're just doing patching. So for me, it's an education piece. People still don't like the answer often, <laughs> but at least I'm trying to share information which is real and legitimate. So for us on council, that means that we really need to make sure that these decisions of where we're spending these capital funds is not political that it's really based on need. And that's where those condition assessments come into play. And we have to, you know, it's a challenge, but we need to stay committed to that. And it's also really challenging to tell constituents, residents that, you know, some of these areas might not be done for 10 years. And then it could be longer because, you know, there might be other things that happen along, I'll just use roads, for example, since I'm on the roads theme, that might happen that then maybe you're 12 years out. And on a political side, you know, do you really want to tell your residents it's going to take 10 years when realistically it might to get to their their area? Uh, so that to me continues to be a challenge. But the education piece on, you know, what is the need? What are we trying to do? And also leverage our constituents and our residents when the elections are happening to put pressure on the types of supports that we need um, in our community when uh, local, you know, when candidates at the provincial and federal level are at our doors, because it's a great time for them to also hear that message as well. But we, we are limited and um, this is a challenge. And at times people will say, just spend all the money on infrastructure and you cannot have a complete whole community that's thriving if you are not spending money on other community and social services. Um, everything is an economic issue. We know that just even from employment, like if people don't have these outlets, uh, then we'll have more challenges on with mental health and then more challenges in our hospital. And then there'll be a workforce challenge when people aren't going to work. So we can't just spend all our money in, in kind of one area in need of the city. You talk about the education aspect, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into that for a second, because while you as a counselor are elected at a ward based system, so that means you represent a certain ward in Welland, when you get sworn in, you're not sworn in as ward counselor, you're sworn in as city of Welland counselor. And that means that you're going to have to make some tough decisions in every budget season, which you're about to go into if you haven't already started, because it is October. Um, that means your ward may not get everything that they want at the end of the day. How much of an education purpose do you have to do to your residents to ensure that you say, as much as you want this, ward one or ward eight or ward six or ward three or ward whatever is a little bit harder off. So we as a city need to focus on them, but we will benefit from that aspect because what's good for one part of the community is good for the entire community. Yeah, that's an ongoing, uh, that's ongoing work. And that's also based on relationships and having champions in the community themselves who can help to support the counselor. Because one thing I did say when I ran is that I'm, I am running and it's me and it's my name, 
But if the community is not there to also support me when I have to take tough decisions, then people aren't going to want to run in these positions. They're not going to want to put themselves in a position to be attacked uh, for whatever decision they're taking. So for me, it's about, you know, celebrating all the, su the success throughout the city, advertising it, and, you know, trying to get people to say, listen, we have to spread out these projects. And it might mean one is in a different ward, but maybe we're getting a different project in a different category that we're looking at the totality of the city. Uh, so that continues to be a challenge no matter what. And I, I kind of anticipate that, um, that some people just will not accept those answers, but other residents will, and they'll understand. And they will take the perspective that, you know what, they're, that at least they're seeing the work being done. And, you know, seeing is believing. So for me, it's like, you can see this, we can all go down that road, or we can all go into this community, and we can see that there's a need there as well. Uh, so it it is tough work um, to kind of remind people that we have to take a, a whole city approach. And that's a constant struggle when you're a counselor. I want to flip the original question on its head a little bit here. And I talk about challenges a lot. And as we said, every municipality has its fair share of challenges. Even the best communities have their fair share of challenges, whether it be grants, infrastructure, so on and so forth. But there's things that are unique. There are things that each community gets right. For the city of Welland, from your perspective, what's the one thing that when you go talk to people at AMO or go talk to surrounding municipalities leaders, you say, you know what, you're doing it right. Welland's doing it better. We've got this covered. <laughs> What's that one thing that you are proud of when it comes to what the city has going for it? Wow, that uh, there's so many things. So to choose one, so is the one challenge. or two, one or okay, two. Okay, I'll do, I'm gonna I'm gonna do two, and okay. one of them I'm gonna talk okay. about attracting business and employment because we've had in the past a bit of a recession. And we have had a renewal in the region and specifically in Welland, uh, becoming a hub for electric, for EV, for electric vehicles, and just becoming a technology driven manufacturing hub with high paying, uh, you know, technology driven uh, jobs. And so for me, that's one thing that we're doing fabulous here in the city is cultivating those relationships, positioning ourselves for that industry. We know that people need jobs. They need good jobs that offer benefits, that offer stability, that offer innovation and change um, to, you know, have for our local residents, uh, you know, and also to attract other types of businesses to come into the city so that people can cut down on their commutes. You know, when you're a city and you can get anywhere from 10 minutes, uh, then that's like the best case scenario. So one of those, I, I you know, one of the issues I have to talk about, yeah, is our businesses. And uh, Lena Mar, for example, who are building a state of the art uh, giga casting facility off Canal Bank here in Welland. And it's going to employ approximately 200 full-time workers in advanced technology driven roles. And that is incredible. You know, when we're talking about, you know, family starting mid-career, you know, later towards career, lots of opportunities for roles. And, you know, we, we are getting other businesses coming because they're seeing that change. They're seeing that motivation and they're seeing the talent that is in our city because we also have Niagara College. And so we have these partnerships with the college to make sure that we're having students trained in the latest fields um, where the jobs are and where they will be in the future. And so those things go hand in hand. Uh, so I wanna talk about that as one success. And um, if I talked about another one, it might kind of get into uh, tourism, but uh, partnerships is really strong in the city of Welland, partnering with the college, partnering with the YMCA and other kind of social services uh, so that uh, we are leveraging every single dollar um, every single piece of talent that we have in our city. It's like you, you've you listened to the show before and you know that I like to talk about <laughs> tourism. And as I said <laughs> prior to us recording, I'm going to be in Welland in November. I know that's not traditionally a tourism time in Canada, but <laughs> God bless it. I'm going to make it a tourism community in November. Um, for yourself... What are the tour? And we don't just have to talk about November. Let's talk about the entire year. Let's talk about everything that goes on in Welland. What are some of the hidden gems? 
what are the gems that you say, you know what, we do great promotion, but I wish these were a little bit promoted a little bit better or people knew about these. So if I was a tourist coming through the city of Welland, what are the hidden gems that I need to see? The hidden gems, even though for us as locals, it's so obvious when we're here, but our, our canal is any kind of activity on the canal. Because when people come, say from the GTA, they're so impressed with the canal and how you can go to Merritt Island, uh, which is beautiful trails. You can ride, cycle, walk. Uh, uh, there's been meditation that has taken place in the park. So that's a hidden gem that no one, people are surprised to see that because it's in our downtown. And when you think of downtowns, you don't think of all this be natural beauty. Uh, the other piece that's close to downtown is Rotary Park, where you can actually do rentals on the docks. And it's one of the first things that I did with my uh, my family, with my brother and his kids. And we had never done this before ourselves in our childhood, but we actually went and it's five minutes from where I live. And we were able to rent paddle boats, um, canoes, kayaks, and the stand-up boards and have this really cool experience downtown. And, and it was very affordable. So I always advise and share this story with new residents when they're like, what can I do? Uh, because you wouldn't think about that. You wouldn't know it. And, you know, we need that kind of shared equipment because everybody can't have their own kayak. So having this is really promoting, um, you know, different kinds of skills, like being able to swim. And that's really important when you do have so much water that you're surrounded by. And then just like that on the canal would also be the flat water center where we have major sporting events, canoeing, uh, kayaking, rowing, dragon boats. We had the 2022 uh, Canada Games here. And uh, I, I don't know 100%, but I suspect that in 2025, the region, Niagara region has the Ontario Parasport. And I suspect that we'll also have games that uh, will be held at the Flatwater Centre as well. So that kind of whole piece around the canal and being right through the middle of our city uh, is really a hidden gem for people. And if I just built on one more piece, it's also our amphitheater um, being on the canal and having concerts there. Uh, and it's such a feature that people are just so, in, you know, they're so in love with it because you get to have this beautiful scenery. And while you're listening to concerts and we have our last concert on the canal tonight, actually, uh, later in the day. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, you can see people on their canoes just paddling along and you're there listening to like a rock concert or you're listening to Latin music or Afro-Caribbean music, uh, depending on what festivals are going on. Correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm getting off of tourism for a second back into the city of Welland, but we'll get back to tourism. But just for my own clarification, the city of Welland, is that a lower tier municipality to Niagara region or are they, is the city of Welland in Niagara region? Like is Niagara region a government, a second a top tier government? So we're two tiers, so we belong. So we, um, yeah, so we do. Uh, we do have a representation at Niagara Region as well. Okay, I didn't know so if that it was separate. Add it's yeah. some municipalities aren't, some are. So that's why I just had to double check. That's that's <laughs> why it makes some of our that's that's why it makes some of our decisions at council a bit more challenging too. When um, our representatives at uh, at the region are different, uh, the mayor's there, but there's two other people, and so sometimes getting those priorities uh, and advocacies, you know, you've got one more uh, layer that you have to work with. And those upper tier counselors are called regional counselors. I know that from my days right. in Clarington. Um, That's right. I, I want to sort of pose the Sophie's Choice question for you. Now you listed off some great hidden gems that I'm excited to go see while I'm in Welland, but what's the one spot for you? What's that one spot that you go, you know what, after a long day of work, after a long day of sitting around a council table and making some tough decisions, is there a spot in the community you can go and decompress at? Yes, there's two, and they're in walking distance from me, so that's why I know it, because I live in downtown. Uh, one is uh, Bridgewater Brewery, and it's our craft beer. Um, uh, well, they, they have craft beer on site, and I do love craft beer. They've got a beautiful ambiance. They've got a back, uh, back door, outdoor space in the back, little space in the front. So it's a great place to go to, uh, great food, great beer. And the other piece I would say is the Bank Art House, and that's on King Street. And what happens there is circus performances, concerts. There's always something creative going on in that space that's art related. 
and you can just drop in. They've got their doors open and it's very, very welcoming. And so our arts are, are, are thriving and they're growing and creating a central hub. And that is one of those places. So anyone creative in the community, you're likely to find them at uh, the Bank Art House. And so for your November visit, uh, you, we should try to coordinate you with one of their activities that are going on. <laughs> it's a it's a political municipal date there, Councillor. You and I, let's yeah. do it. Um, so my last question, and I, I usually ask it in a certain way, but I was on your website, the City of Welland's website, and I found a quote on your website that I think encapsulates exactly what I want to say here. And my last question usually is, what makes the city of Welland such a unique place to live, work, and play? But before you answer, I want to read something that I found on your website. And hopefully I'm not taking anything away from about what you're to, about to say when I say it. But on your website, it says, what makes Welland a great place to live, work, play, and invest? And it's simple. And it, all it says on your website, and quoting here, it's the community. It's the people. It's the facilities. It's the amenities. In Welland, they are fortunate to have a big city conveniences with small town feel many municipalities strive for. For you, what makes Welland such a unique place to live, work, and play, knowing that that is what your city is promoting? Uh, it's exactly that. And so I'm so glad you found that quote <laughs> because I was going to say it's community. Anytime there's a fundraiser, uh, a new festival, everyone is rallying together. You see businesses coming together, community associations, um, individuals coming together and they're saying, we're gonna take care of this issue. And that to me is really unique. I know every community has it, but our community spirit is so high here um, and it's infectious. We have people coming from surrounding communities, coming to participate in our programs, coming to volunteer and spend their time. And it's also about the innovation that we do here and the way we look at things. And I, I wanna just give a plug for um, a children's book that was produced by the city and released for free in both French and English uh, because we do have a large uh, Francophone community here as well. And it's, it's done from the perspective of a child's um, view. And it speaks about community. It speaks about what's available in our community, the different experiences you can have. So when you think about Welland and we talk about community, you can have a free book that talks to you that you can read with your children or your, your grandparents reading with you know, their grandchildren or uh, whomever are part of those relationships, but advertising and promoting Welland set from day one, whether you're a resident who's been here for a hundred years or you're a resident that it's your first day, you belong in Welland. And we are going to get you up to speed on everything the city has to offer as soon as we can so that you can then get out there, enjoy it, and then start contributing. So for anyone who wants a link to that book, I will have it in the show notes. So if you're listening to this on uh, Spotify or you, uh, Apple Podcasts, please pull over or check it out when you get home. If you're watching this on YouTube, just scroll down and you can certainly check out that link. And there's a link to the City of Welland's website to learn more about this great community. Counselor, Charmila, I want to thank you so much. This has been a wonderful 40 minutes to sit down and talk to someone so passionate about municipal municipalities and municipal government. I, I Hopefully we do get a chance to meet while I'm in Welland in November. If not, uh, hopefully if you're at FCM or at AMO again, and I'm actually going to make it to one of these AMO conferences, <laughs> we can continue this conversation. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for the opportunity. It's wonderful. Love to talk about the city of Welland uh, day and night. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders truly making a difference within their own community. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to bring these important conversations to light. So stay connected, stay informed. And until next time, we'll see you here on the Cross Border Interviews. Mm -hmm.